Good afternoon. Welcome to three o'clock with SOC this Monday, April 20th. Give me a second while I welcome our Spanish speaking neighbors to the forum. Buenas tardes. Gracias por estar nuevamente con nosotros hoy a las tres con SAC. Si quieren acceso al programa en su idioma en español, por favor marcan un número donde van a poder tener acceso uh, por medio de una teleconferencia. El número aparece en la pantalla es 425-436-6200. Cuando contestan la llamada, por favor, comparten el clave o la contraseña que aparece, empezando con el número 6, que es 627-682. Thank you uh, again for being with us. We have another week of very critical information to share with you, and we're glad that you're here with us so that we can do so. My name is Tammy Rivera. I'm the executive director and lead organizer for Southside Organizing Center. I'd like to share with you that we're here with you. We haven't missed a day. Uh, you can access, it, access us in all the same ways you used to before the safer at home order, except for we can't see you quite yet in person. So you can call us at 414-672-8090. You can email us at soc at socmilwaukee.org. And you can communicate with us on all our social media platforms, including here on this Facebook Live in the comments section. And all the numbers and information that we're sharing, you'll also find in the comments section so you don't have to worry about missing um, any details of that information. Today, we're gonna continue our special guest and include our, regularly, um, our regular segments um, of the forum. Uh, before we get started today, I want to make sure to share a disclaimer that the views and opinions shared on the forum are not necessarily those held with SOC as we want to bring you uh, the local leadership from our community to share original source information, information that's accurate, that you can trust, and uh, to discuss their perspectives and opinions on the things that are taking place and the ways that we can move forward. Uh, today, I want to remind you all that we also have a special promotion going out, going on, and this week's a little bit different. Uh, this week, uh, you can be entered into our drawing for a daily, Monday through Friday, $25 gift certificate to a local small business that supports SOC or a small business that is doing some incredibly good deeds during this very challenging time. In the past, there were all kinds of ways that you can enter, and we hope you'll still do all of those ways, but we're really needing you to complete the surveys uh, for the forum because we just started this new way of accessing um, our relationship with you uh, via a digital or virtual form and we need your feedback. We wanna know what's working well, what are the things we can do differently, and any topics you wanna hear about. So please fill out the survey. It's only four questions. It's what do you think we're doing good? What could we do different? Is the information we're sharing with you of value? And what is missing or your comments? It doesn't take more than five minutes to do it. It's both in English and in Spanish, and you can access it again here in the comments section. You just click and it'll take you right there. And so we encourage you to do that. And that's how you can enter the drawing. All of this week is by completing the survey. We still hope and want you to like the Facebook Live, to share it, to engage with us with comments and questions. Um, but in order to enter the drawing uh, this week, we're gonna focus on the Sur surveys because we need those. Uh, that's how we know to do our job well, and that's how we demonstrate to our partners who are funding us what your thoughts are directly. All right, uh, getting to the topic of the day. We're gonna get to our guest in just a second, but while I was waiting um, for the forum to start, I see that the governor issued uh, two press releases, so I wanna share those um, with you if you'll be patient, because you know sometimes that can take a little longer than we'd like. And also it's not always um, 
you know, easy to get through in terms of information. So the first, the, the latest one is Governor Evers announces a new plan. And that plan is the Badger Bounce Back Plan. As you know, the Badgers are state animal and uh, we rally around that image uh, for a lot of our um, camaraderie. And so he announced today um, an important program uh, and a plan for us as a state to reopen our economy in phases. And he says here, it includes steps to make sure that both the workers and the businesses are prepared to reopen as soon as possible and as safely as possible. Um, this um, is being coordinated with the Department of Health Services, um, Order 31 to establish and process and outline the phases of the, the plan of the emergency order. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and here's a quote um, from him. As we've learned over the past month, it is the most difficult of circumstances. Wisconsinites will rise to the occasion, helping each other and working together to do what's best for our families, our neighbors, and our communities. That's what the Badger Bounce Back is all about, our resilience as people and as a state. I'm excited and hopeful about this plan while being safe at home continues to be important. This plan is an all out attack on the virus and it begins the process of preparing our businesses and workforce for the important planning that will result in safe and logical reopening of the economy. Uh, the plan, he says, is informed in part by the president's guidelines for opening up America again. That was issued by the White House on April 16. Um, currently, um, it says currently Wisconsin doesn't meet the criteria um, establishing for reopening the state. And hopefully the Badger bounce back plan takes important steps to get us there. Um, this plan is aimed at decreasing um, coronavirus cases and the deaths um, to keep them at low levels and increase our healthcare system capacity so that uh, businesses can reopen. Uh, this should help increase access to more testing and expand testing labs capacity. Um, and then everyone, um, it says here, everyone who needs a test should get it. Uh, this is, the state is setting a new goal of being able to test 85,000 people um, per week. And so that's about 12,000 tests a day. Um, so that's what's happening. Um, it says, you know, they want to be able to roll this out quickly. There's a lot more to this, um, but I don't want to keep you completely, um, you know, being read to for the, for the next couple of minutes. Let me see if I can pull out some more. Wisconsinites who test positive um, being interviewed within 24 hours of receiving their tests and um, their contacts being interviewed 48 hours after test results. So they're wanting to not only test people, but follow up with people. Um, and so that is uh, his first of two uh, announcements. And as we shared with you, we want to be giving you the latest information that we're aware of so that you have the same information that other organizations do. There was one other press release that, that was shared as well today. And this one is uh, Governor Ever Evers announces Wisconsin is taking big steps to increase testing. And I bet this is very much related to what he just shared. Um, so I want to see, these are the ways in which he says uh, they're working on expanding that ability. So one way, 11 National Guard teams are serving as rapid in a rapid response role in hotspots and underserved areas of the state. They'll collect samples to get tested. Um, this weekend, one of those teams 
um, began testing inmates and staff at the Milwaukee House of Corrections to help control that art outbreak. Two teams of citizen soldiers will be staffing um, the Milwaukee Health Services clinics as well to get samples on MLK Junior Drive and Silver Spring Road. The state is working with tribal partners uh, to ensure they get testing and a thousand will be delivered per week to tribal health clinics. Uh, exact science, Sciences is devoting a significant portion of its lab capacity to C19 or COVID testing. This will um, help the state with approximately 20,000 tests each week uh, that will be distributed throughout the healthcare system in the state. Um, more about testing, more about expanding lab capacity. How they're gonna, 2200 test collection supplies and PPE are headed to Green Bay in response to an outbreak with significant risk to that community. Wisconsin Diagnostic Labs, um, much appreciated support to 16th Street Community Health Clinics through drive-through testing project. project. So lots of things happening, and we are wanting to make sure that you all know what we know. Uh, it, it might not be as succinct and as um, packaged as we would like to get through these conversations, but uh, there you go, the two latest things from the governor. Um, and speaking of state business, we're very happy to have our guest with us today, State Representative Marisabel Cabrera, and she'll be joining us to talk about uh, what's happening at the state level and her thoughts about the election that took place last Saturday and how we move forward. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for being with us. Thank you so much for having me. Um, hopefully I can provide some answers to folks out there. Yeah, I was just reading the governor's two press releases for the day. Um, and shared with people everything he said about the Badger um, plan. I forget what it's called because I just Badger read it. Back. Yeah, a Badger bounce back plan. Shared a little bit about that. I shared about his announcements about expanded testing capabilities. And so feel free to talk about those. And then anything else you would like to add about our COVID-19 response? And we'd love to get your thoughts about the why of the election that took place Tuesday. We've been trying to have our residents understand all the dynamics that went into place um, that, that allowed that election to happen and sort of where we go from here. So, so far we've had the ACLU on and Judge Pedro Colon, uh, law professor um, Ed Ballone, um, and we've had some community leaders like Dr. Tony Bias and Christine Newman Ortiz. But um, I'd like to just open this time for you to just share what you know about the COVID-19 situation, what's happening at the state level, and then for your response about the election. Okay, so uh, as far as the uh, the two press releases that were put out today, um, so, uh, we were forwarded many other documents along with those press releases, obviously, for more detailed information. And uh, the, the first uh, press release details um, different aspects of how the governor um, and uh, secretary of DHS, Palm, um, intend to uh, ramp up our testing capabilities. And, um, and, and that ties into the uh, Badger bounce back plan in that um, the goal really is to um, increase testing, increase tracing, and tracking. And basically because in order for us to be able to go back to normal, uh, we need to make sure that um, there's a downward trend in cases, in positive cases, and 
um, also in debts, and that we are prepared to be able to continue to keep that downward trend um, when we decide to open up little by little businesses and um, other organizations. Um, so the, the, the contact tracing is really important because that is how we limit the spread. Uh, we wanna make sure that when we are aware of a known positive test case, that um, anybody that that person had contact with is also reached out to in order for they, for those folks to be tested and make sure that whoever is positive can be quarantined and isolated from the rest of the population. Um, and so there is a lot more to it um, as far as also what sort of requirements and guidelines uh, businesses will need to follow in order to keep their employees safe and the customers that they serve, um, as well as the family members that they go home to after having been in their establishments. Um, so my big priority from reading all of this is to learn how specifically that is going to uh, impact Milwaukee the city of Milwaukee and the county at large, because if you look into the weeds, um, there's a little bit more information as far as, um, in some cases, places that have hot spots and specific zip codes that have higher um, rates of cases. They might not. Ha they might have a whole separate set of rules that apply to them. And so I would like to know what those rules are and mm -hmm. how uh, it's going to be implemented because obviously Milwaukee is one of the largest cities. It is the largest city in the state. And so how are you going to only apply one set of rules to this section of the state who are so many other people from outside of this county are constantly coming in and out? So how are we going to maintain the safety of the people who reside in Milwaukee County. Um, so that is my priority and after I get off of this uh, <laughs> forum with y'all is what I'm going to follow up on. Uh, because we know that already uh, roughly half of the cases of the entire state are within the county of Milwaukee. So we definitely are getting the brunt of the pandemic. And so we wanna make sure that um, we're not, you know, rushing to reopen the economy and jeopardize whatever progress we've made because we have noticed already an increase in cases. And it's not surprising because it's within the window of when symptoms are supposed to manifest um, from the election day fiasco. So um, that's why if you look at the trajectory of how cases are starting to go back up, it's literally what was expected to happen if this election were to was carried out and it did um, get carried out that way. So um, that is something for Milwaukee in particular, we need to keep a very close eye on. Um, the election itself, there were many, many things that were going on behind the scenes. Um, lots of heated discussions um, between, you know, different members of different parties and within um, parties themselves. So I, as a Democrat, um, I'm, I am a member of the minority party. And so we don't really get to dictate when um, the legislature convenes. That is in the hands of, as far as the assembly, is um, the speaker, Robin Voss, and because he's in the majority party and he's the majority leader. And so um, that is something that from way back months and months before the election, we at Democrats, the caucus, were pressing um, for the election to either be um, converted to absentee ballot only or postponed to a later date. And that was just not being well received um, from folks on the other side of the aisle. And also, um, I personally <laughs> was pressuring folks within our caucus to be more vocal and more aggressive and um, 
uh, pushing our own uh, governor to take a little bit more of a bold stance. And so that was something that unfortunately um, the Republicans did not feel a need to uh, convene the assembly um, until the very last minute. Uh, and that was after the election, but prior to the election, they didn't feel it was necessary. Um, they also, I believe, wanted the election to take place specifically because it they anticipated and historically it would have it should have uh, benefited their outcomes more um, and it, it just happened to be that it didn't but that's what they were hoping for was that there would be a lower turnout from folks not wanting to expose themselves to this virus and risk their lives in order to vote um, the governor he did at one point uh, request uh, a special session in order to convert the election to uh, mail absentee ballots only. Unfortunately, by the time he decided to make that call, um, all of the uh, election commission clerks said that would it be impossible. They don't have the materials or the ability to send out absentee ballots to the entire state. Um, so that even though he did request it, it was sort of something that it, it, it was too little too late, so to speak. Um, and then the same thing happened with him requesting for the election itself to be postponed to a later date. It, 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 he sort of waited to the last minute. I do believe in his, from his perspective, he believed he did not have the authority to change the election date because in Wisconsin statutes, it actually spe specifies when our elections are to take place. The specific date is in the statute. Um, so, and I personally disagreed with that when I heard it the first time I did my own research. I am a, an attorney by profession. And so I did my own analysis and I disagreed because it does state that in the event that there is a sort of public health emergency, um, it does permit the governor to suspend statutes, which would be the election statute in this case. So when he finally did do it at that point, it was kind of unusual because he had already made so many public statements indicating that he lacked the authority. So it confused many people because on the one hand, you said you don't have the authority and now you're issuing an order changing the date of the election. Uh, which of course the Republicans immediately jumped on. And um, prior to that, there were already a number of uh, lawsuits by different grassroots organizations and the Democratic National Committee um, requesting from the courts that the all these changes be done to the election because again, we are in the middle of a pandemic mm -hmm. and it would be unsafe and it would um, disenfranchise lots of people who don't want to risk their lives in order to go vote. Um, those cases were consolidated into one, and there were three of them, and they were consolidated into one. And then the judge in that particular case, um, he essentially sort of uh, reprimanded both the governor and the legislature for failing to act and the issues that they're charged with. Um, and also sort of saying that it's not the position, it's not the role of the judiciary branch to uh, address health emergencies. Um, and so what he did do was allow for um, certain changes, which were he uh, extended the early voting Mm -hmm. by one day. Uh, he uh, indicated that if a person really had a difficulty in obtaining a witness to um, sign their absentee ballot, that they could, in the alternative, submit a sworn statement uh, testing to the fact that they tried and they were just not able to secure a witness, and that absentee ballots could be submitted until April, April 13th. So the Republicans immediately appealed that decision um, to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court 
by that point, the one extra day had already lapsed, so that was moot. Um, and then they, the, the signature requirement was reinstated mm -hmm. and um, they, they tweaked the uh, April 13th uh, extension to require that absentee ballots be postmarked by election day. Um, and they will only be counted if they were postmarked by election day and received by April 13th, as opposed to what the original federal court judge has stated that as long as they were delivered by April 13th, whether in person or via mail, it's sort of uh, lowered the number of ballots that would be counted because they had to be postmarked. Mm -hmm. And so that was uh, what ended up happening. And, and as we saw in the news, many, many people turned out to vote and, and exposed themselves to that possibility of uh, contracting uh, COVID-19. And uh, we, we still are yet to see the full impact of uh, what that turnout will be. Um, as far as the legitimacy of the election results, um, that is actually being taken up in another lawsuit. So <laughs> that's to be determined apparently, um, but I, I, I don't see the results being overturned at this point, it's unfortunate because so many people never received the ballots they requested. Many people, um, the, their ballots were stuck in a post office somewhere. Um, some of the folks who actually followed all of the rules, um, their ballots for whatever reason were not postmarked. And so there was a difficulty of whether, you know, this different county, different election commissions deciding are we going to count them are we not going to count them which ones do we count you know how do we know that they were submitted um and, and they had people from the post office provide explanations they had people from uh different you know organizations give their um point of views and some of them were counted in some cities and some of them were not and so it's really uh was disparate as far as whose uh, ballots were counted and whose were not. I mean, even some folks had their ballots uh, submitted timely and they were postmarked, but there was no date on the postmarks. So <laughs> it was- Oh, for goodness sake. <laughs> so it, it was kind of, that. it's not that, that's not the voters fault though. They did everything that they were supposed to do. And yet, are we not gonna count this because the postal, service failed to include a date on their postmark. Very complicated things taking place. Lots of questions um, still to be answered. It, your, your presence today has shed some more light on what we've heard about the situation, um, some more details that have been useful. Um, a couple of follow-up uh, questions. Well, one is in terms of COVID, lots of information still coming in at a quick speed, too much for any of us um, to manage. As you shared, you even have to dig into the details of the plan and that there's a lot of that. Uh, we're trying to do our best here to share that, organize that information and share it uh, with residents. But a key question people had was, about what would happen to the trajectory of death and infections um, spread because of the election. And so fortunately for us, we'll be able to look at that information because there was the trajectory pre-election and what would happen after. Unfortunately, people are gonna lose their lives and other people are gonna be affected, but we'll be able to share anytime there's mass congregations like that, what the result of that is. That may help folks understand the severity of the situation when they see those numbers. Um, the, it'll be interesting, uh, Representative Cabrera, to find out more about the plan and how maybe urban or metropolitan areas are uh, disproportionately impacted by uh, what what happens there. I mean, above all things, life is the most valuable thing. Um, but I wonder too um, how much it will play 
what what will play the fact that metropolitans by nature have a higher concentration of people so what does that look like when we compare let's say the number of people who live in milwaukee versus that same number across the state um that's the, the they're sharing but we're also in a smaller space and so all that is logical uh what what's concerning about that is metropolitan areas will be you know disproportionately impacted as you said so that'll be an interesting to continue uh to follow uh we didn't uh, hear earlier that three lawsuits were consolidated into one so that's interesting um it was uh interesting that all actions were taken at the last minute we're not understanding still why um first of all why the legislature didn't act itself so can i ask you were there any reasons contributed by the legislature the majority that's that responded to why they did not want to step in when there was time to have everybody vote absentee ballot was there a reason given for that well there was two reasons one of them being that they um from their perspective they believe that the election could be carried out in a safe way, um, which clearly they don't understand the virus and science in general when uh, it's a highly contagious and fatal disease that can be transferred very easily. We are, and on the one hand, we have a stay at home order that pre prohibits folks from gathering in groups of 10 or more, and yet we are having thousands of people go and congregate in the same location to go vote. So that was totally contrary to any guideline from any organization, from mm -hmm. any party. They all said this is bad and it should not be happening. Yeah. Um, so, and, and their other reason for not wanting to um, go strictly to absentee ballots is because they they claim that that would be subject to voter fraud and that there would be an increased number of cases um, where folks are voting where they are ineligible to vote or voting more than once or et cetera. Yeah, we, do, we don't have the time today, but that's an interesting argument about if their response was, we disagree with the public health officials or the science officials on whether the- I mean, you saw the speaker of the assembly at full PPE from head to toe, as he was saying, it's totally safe to come out and vote. <laughs> was an amazing sight. So they, um, they were sort of, it, 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 it just baffled me, and for me, it really made me angry, to be frank, because it's lives that are going to be lost because you refuse to accept the reality of the situation. And the fact that you just didn't care because you thought it would benefit your party in securing another Supreme Court seat, um, it shows a total lack of uh, regard for human life in general. And so that, for me, my main, uh, point was that we need to stop this election to save lives. And, and that is something that I, I vehemently argued within my own caucus. And I delivered, pers you know, I made it, I said it to the governor and his office and anybody who would hear me, I was constantly saying that this needs to be done. And, and even if you don't believe you have the authority, you should issue the order anyway, let them take sue you because you need to do this to save lives. That's the number one priority that we should be concerned about is saving people's lives. Yeah, so that'll be, we'll see what happens with that in future arguments, but it seems like the root issue in that argument is we don't believe the public health and science officials in a, in, in a legislative sense, but in a personal sense, I believe it as a leader because I geared up in, in, in Boss's case completely. And so um, that's something uh, that we'll have to, um, continue to hold people accountable about. Hey, from Milwaukee too, and knowing the statistics from Milwaukee and the data that we have here, it's it's a real thing, it's it's happening and we can't 
sit in denial and just pretend like it's not happening. Yeah. So that, that, you know, no one had answered, well, what, what reasonings did they give? And one that you said is, well, they, they felt you can vote safely. Although personally they demonstrated in their actions, or at least the leader did that he didn't believe one individual was safe to speak to the legislature, but thousands of people could get in line to vote without the gear, without the gear that he had. Right. And so, you know, this is what we have to tease out as people and pay attention to and hold people uh, accountable to. And then in terms of the it's voter. It's really vote. important, actually, because we still have a number of elections coming up this year. So it's not something that is a one and done. It, we still have an election in May. We have an election in August and elections in November. So there's three more upcoming elections. And how are we going to uh, deal with those elections? And uh, we've, at, 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 uh, when we met last to pass the Wisconsin COVID-19 relief package, which I voted against, um, they, they did not include anything in there relating to elections. Uh, our, the Democrats, we did submit an amendment to that would include some um, changes to upcoming elections and converting them to absentee ballot only and a number of other things. And it was immediately shut down by the majority Republican party. Um, and so it is something that still needs to be dealt with because are we going to, we, we already see it ticking upwards. The curve is ticking upwards. Are we gonna have another election? So keep making it go up higher in our, mm -hmm. and I don't think they're gonna um, meet again or deal with it because if you hear what their talking points are now is they want to reopen Wisconsin for business. So mm -hmm. they want to go, they want to have everything go right back to the way it was before the pandemic. And, and we're not ready for that. We're just not. And so if they want the whole business to go back to as usual, as I, then they're unlikely to want to do any sort of election reform, even if it's temporary for while this pandemic is ongoing. Well, then then um, another question from, we have a whole two pager of questions, yes. concerns and comments that residents, and I just added to it from this discussion, okay. um, want answers. We don't have the answer to that today. So then begs the question, what authority does the national or the state public health department have in declaring um, in-person elections unsafe uh, and then maybe we can have you back another day to continue to explore so this if issue. Actually, if you think about it, so a lot of people are a little bit confused as far as what role or what authority does the governor have and what authority does the secretary of um, HHS have, um, the, the health services. Um, and, and so the governor issued on March 12th, uh, a state of emergency, a health emergency for the entire state. And that by statute is only permitted to last for 60 days. It can be extended only by a joint resolution by the legislature. So as probably unlikely to happen because the Republicans are already saying they want business to go back to normal. So that order will expire on May 11th. Um, and then after that order on March 24th, he, the governor and the um, secretary of the health department uh, issued a, 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 an order together for the um, safer at home, uh, which required folks to stay home if unless certain criteria applied. Um, that order is applicable until April 24th. And so um, based on, I won't get into why I voted against the COVID-19 relief because that's a whole another sh forum. But <laughs> mm, we'll do another day on the forum. Many of the, the, the benefits that came in that bill are tied to the emergency, the health emergency order oh. that the governor issued. So that was another one of the amendments that the Democrats had submitted because it was kind of like, yeah, well, this order is expiring on May 11th. What is this relief only 
valid for 30 days. What do you mean? Yeah. <laughs> and, and some provisions in the bill were like, um, until the expiration of this uh, order, plus 30 days or plus 60 days, depending. It was a mixed bag, basically. And so, um, but that first safer at home order um, was premised on the governor's authority that's issued by statute. Um, I think it's 323 something. Uh, it's chapter 323. And then also the, the secretary's authority under a separate statute is 252 something. And so, but it's if you look at the order, it's only signed by the secretary. So, because in the statute it says when there is an issue of a contagion that the secretary of health has all of these authorities to do all of these things to keep the public safe and keep the, the endemic from spreading, right? So this second order that is to extend the stay at home uh, requirements up until May 26, that's also from the secretary and it's based on the authority issued by statute and it says it very clearly and under these circumstances, the secretary has the authority to do all of these things if it's meant to protect the public and keep the, the virus from spreading. Uh, and so that's what they're basing this on. And so technically, I suppose she could issue an order saying the election is going to be done by all absentee ballots only. Um, whether she does that is a whole nother story. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me based on the Badger bounce back plan that they're very optimistic about things going according to their plan. Um, and and I, I'm yeah. not that optimistic <laughs> because I'm from Milwaukee and I see what's happening in Milwaukee. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that concludes our time today, but we definitely have more to talk about and we'll, uh, coordinate with you to dig into some of these other aspects a little more. It was super helpful for you to be here. We're so grateful for your um, knowledge and your experience there uh, to help us try to understand a very complicated um, fight and fights and reasonings right. and values. We thank you for your time. Uh, be safe and we look forward to seeing you again. Thank you for the invite and um, I'm always happy to educate and inform anybody who has any questions. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, we're gonna move quickly through the rest of the segment of the program. I do wanna say some quick hellos uh, to folks, anyone who's with us today. Um, hola, Lily, Yolanda, Mari, I'm glad to have you. Um, with us. Uh, we're going to move to a uh, coronavirus uh, resource update and, um, and then I'll be back with you uh, to bring our next segment. Hi everyone, my name is Taylor and I am the coronavirus coordinator with SOC. Last week, people were expected to receive payments via direct deposit into their bank accounts. If you weren't included in the first wave of payments, then you will get one in the next few weeks, according to a memo from the House Waves and Means Committee. Um, that direct deposit information came directly from your 2018 or 2019 tax returns. It is not too late to update that information if you haven't already, um, because if you don't update the information, they will mail a check to you. Mail checks will start going out this week. They'll start going out April 24th for people who did not have their direct deposit information on file. So about five mail checks will be mailed out weekly. So to be able to reach out everyone that's getting a mail check, that might take up to 20 weeks, which is about five months for all checks to be sent. So it is super important to make sure that you are updating your direct deposit information um, on the IRS website to ensure that you're getting your direct deposit uh, directly to your account. And the payments, the mail checks will be sent out in order of lowest to highest income so that people with the smallest incomes will receive their checks first. 
we know that many people are frustrated right now because they haven't received their uh, stimulus check in their bank account even though they have filled out direct deposit. Um, some tips that you can check um, to make sure that you do receive your stimulus check um, or some reasons why you haven't received it is that you still have not filed your 2018 or 2019 um, tax return. Your money also went into an old bank account. So just make sure that, again, you're checking that website to make sure that your bank account information hasn't changed um, and make sure that the information is accurately presented on there. Um, Get My Payment is the new IRS tool that is on the irs.gov uh, website. We know that it has frustrated many users who say they have been an, unable to track their stimulus check since it la launched last week. Um, so some of the displays and payment statuses that you can check. Um, if you click the link below, you'll see that there's a link to irs.gov slash coronavirus slash get my payment. That link will also be available in the comment section. So if you go click on that link, get my payment will display one of the following payment statuses. So it's going to tell you your payment status right up front. So you either, um, your payment has been processed, uh, payment date is available, and the payment is to be sent either by direct deposit or mail. Easy peasy, that's the information there. And if you're eligible um, but a payment hasn't been processed, it'll let you know your payment date is not available right now. So that's the first thing that it will let you know. Um, two, if they need more information from you, if you are eligible for a payment but we but the IRS does not have your direct deposit information, it's gonna tell you that, um, and you'll be able to update or change in your information. So like I stated, if you had old bank information, you're gonna to wanna to click on this tool and update that information right away. Um, the last and final option, which a lot of people haven't been experiencing, is that your payment status is not available. So right now, the IRS is not able to determine your eligibility. Um, so this could be because you didn't file a 2018 or 2019 tax return or you recently filed it and they haven't processed your information yet. Um, the information is only updated one time a day. So if you are checking multiple times, you're refreshing your page and you're, you're clicking on that get my payment information, there's going to be no change. It, they only update it on a 24 hour um, period. Um, according to the Treasury, several million people have filed their taxes via H&R Block, TurboTax, and other services, and they were unable to get their payments because the IRS did not have their direct deposit information on file. So this is according to the Treasury companies and experts. The IRS and Treasury officials said they are aware of these issues and they are working to fix them for you. Um, a Treasury spokesperson woman noted that the IRS processed nearly 80 million payments in less than three weeks. And that's just over half of the 150 million payments that they are expected to go out. Um, so they are working on that problem and they are getting that fixed. So just to repeat, if you have not updated your bank account information, please do so right away by clicking the link in the comments um, and signing up for that direct deposit so you don't have to wait for your check to be mailed to you. Um, I encourage you to visit SockMilwaukee.org for more coronavirus updates and resources. We update that daily. Um, we have an entire page dedicated, dedicated to the coronavirus um, and the resources. So thank you guys so much for joining us today on today's live forum. Uh, we are going to um, have Tammy back on to introduce our next segment. Thank you, Taylor. That was really important information and we've gotten a lot of interest from the community wanting to know more information about that stimulus check. Now with us, we're gonna move quickly into our civic engagement section where Gabe is gonna share or have um, some information about the uh, election and voting and the census. Hey everyone. Happy to be here with all of you again. So I'm just gonna take a couple minutes to share some opportunities that are available for tomorrow. So for those that don't know, we have two new phenomenal women joining the Common Council, Jocasta Zamaripa, who will be serving, who has served in the State Assembly for a num number of years, 
and will now be the District 8 Alder Woman, and Maria uh, Marina Dmitrievich, who was a county supervisor for a number of years, will now be serving as District 14 Alder Woman. And this is, uh, you'll see here, the, the photo that's coming up is that tomorrow they're doing their virtual oath of office. Um, so tomorrow at 2 p.m. will be Marina's, and then at 12.30 will be Rocasta Zamaripas. And that's her photo right there. And so this is historic that they're joining the Common Council because it will bring the number of women serving on the Common Council at once to its to the highest it's ever been. So um, Jocasta and Marina will be joining Malele Kags, Shansia Lewis, and Nakia Dodd on the, the Common Council. And now five out of the 15 members will be women. So a third of the Common Council will now be made up of women. And this is just really exciting as we continue to work towards more substantial gender equity in our society. We just really look forward to seeing what they'll be able to do. And you can actually see them in action tomorrow at the first Common Council Charter meeting at 9 a.m. So you can go to milwaukee.gov slash channel 25 and then click uh, some options will appear and you can click the red one that says channel 25. And this gives live feeds of all of the meetings. And you'll even see on the right side that there's a number of upcoming meetings. And this is a really cool way to just stay engaged in local politics to see what new ordinances are coming out, what new policies are coming out, budget information, all types of committee meetings. So it's just a really great way to stay engaged in local politics. So much happens at local politics that we don't even realize are local politics. And it's really important to, to follow that. So again, milwaukee.gov slash channel 25, and you can see the link to that meeting show up um, when you follow that link. Um, something to keep in mind, they'll be discussing the safe vote legislation that I talked about last week, brought forth by Alderman elect Marina, that will essentially allow for all registered voters in Milwaukee to receive an absentee ballot application for the fall election. And so this is really important legislation coming forth. And it, like I said, will really help reduce disenfranchisement for this fall election and ensure that everybody that is registered can get their absentee ballot applications at the very least. So it will make things go a lot smoother. If it runs, if it rolls out quickly, then everyone will get their absentee ballots on time, ideally. And so this will all be discussed at the first charter meeting of this new council tomorrow. And so we encourage all of you to, to watch it on, on the, uh, to watch it virtually. Um, so some other exciting news, I wanna introduce you all to a special guest named Captain Census. And we have a video for you all to, to see. And as that gets queued up, I just wanna remind everyone that after June 1st is when the Census Bureau will start sending out representatives to collect information door to door about the census. So you should be doing it online, by phone or by mail to avoid someone knocking on your door if you don't want that. So again, after June 1st, the, the start date has not been determined officially yet because we don't know what the pandemic will look like at that point, but that is something to keep in mind. So. If we have the video ready, you can all meet this fabulous person. I don't know if it's ready. Hello, Wisconsin. Captain Census here. And it's my favorite time of the decade. Time to fill out my 2020 census form. Yeah. And I know right now there's a lot going around in the community, but it's more important than ever that you were counted in the 2020 census. And the beauty of it is, it's never been easier to do from home. So you can do it right here at your kitchen table, online, by phone, or you can do it and send it in the mail. I'm gonna do it online. Let's do it. 10 minutes or less, that's gonna change the next 10 years. So we're gonna go to 2020, my2020census.gov. Um, we wanna make sure that we do it in one session um, because it will time out if you don't complete it. So let's get started here. Start questionnaire. 
So you're gonna get a unique ID on your letter from the Census Bureau and you're gonna punch that in. If you happen to lose this letter, that's completely fine. They have a button here in case you lost your Census ID, you can do it anyway. Do, 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 do. All right, so now it's asking me if, if this ID does is indeed tied to this address. Yes, it is. Next step. On April 1st, 2020, will I be living or staying at this address? Yes, I am. What is my name and telephone number? All right, we got a Captain Census. Telephone number, nice and easy. All right, we're gonna start some household questions. How many people live and stay in my house? Two. All right, who else is in the house? My lovely spouse, of course. Now we wanna make sure we don't miss any children. Children are the most undercounted. Cabin Census doesn't have kids yet, so we're just gonna skip this question. No additional people to list. All right, um, now we need to see if we're a homeowner or a renter, and Captain Census is currently a renter, so we wanna make sure that that is recorded. Now we're gonna answer questions about each person on, in the, on the survey. What's Captain Census's gender? What is his day of birth? We wanna make sure that all children that are born on April 1st, 2020 are counted. Next, we're gonna get into questions about Hispanic origin. Captain Census is not of Hispanic, Latino, or Spanish origin. Then they're gonna ask about race. And if you need guidance on this, the Census Bureau does have guidance on how to answer the race questions on their website. That's it for me. Now on to my spouse here. The answer Every question um, for other people in your household is how they are in relation to the head of household. And now that I've got every person's questions answered in the household, we're going to go on to final questions. So um, would you like to make sure everyone is only counted once? Some people live or stay in more than one place. Um, with the grandparents attending college, in the military, or jail or prison, or having a second residence, does any of that apply to people in our house? Nope. You're almost finished. Um, we can choose to edit it or submit it at this point. And since I feel good about all the answers to our questions, we're gonna hit submit. Thanks for completing the 2020 census questionnaire. We got a confirmation number here and uh, you can save and print the screen for your records. And it's that easy, getting counted, making sure billions of federal dollars are coming to your community um, and making sure that you get the political representation that you deserve. It's literally 10 minutes or less that can change the next decade. So make sure you help Captain Census power up and get counted in the 2020 census and make Wisconsin number one again. So as you can see, Captain Census did his census very easily. And as you heard through him going through the questions, there are no questions about documentation, about legal status, about anything like that. So please make sure you're filling out it out. It doesn't matter if you're documented or undocumented. None of that matters and all of your information is private. So again, do that online by phone or by mail. After June 1st, they will be sending out people to knock on your doors for the information. This is really important for political representation and for funding for your states and communities. So make sure you fill it out. That's all I have for you today. And here's Tammy back with a goodbye, I assume. Thank you. That was really important information. I'm so happy you all got to meet Captain Census. He's one of my favorite people on a personal note. He's like the Native American version of my youngest son. So I got a lot of affection for him. Love his energy and his courage and his creativity. I uh, want to give you a heads up about this week's forums. You don't want to miss the rest of the guests for the week. We have with us um, coming up yet this week, County Supervisor Silvia Ortiz-Velez, who'll be talking to us 
about county, uh, county services. We have Senator Tim Carpenter with us. Uh, Sylvia will be with us on Thursday and, and Senator Carpenter Friday. We're still uh, finalizing who we're going to have tomorrow. And the next day we have invitations out to the new to older women on the Common Council that were mes messaged, men mentioned, excuse me, getting tongue tied earlier. Uh, Want to remind you to fill out the survey in order to enter our, our certificate for a drawing. Um, and if we can have that uh, announcement come up now. Hi, Community Forum, Marisol here. For this week, April 20th through the 24th, the only way to enter our $25 gift certificate drawing is by filling out the survey that's located in the comments section. Make sure to do that. Thanks so much for tuning in. Now let's find out who's today's winner. Today's winner is Mauricio Ramirez. Mauricio, contact SA in order to uh, get your certificate by emailing us at soc at socmilwaukee.org. And now we have some thank yous to our funder partners. We're sorry we're running a little late. This is the first time it's happened on the show, but as you know, there was a lot of important information. So right now we'd like to do some thank yous and remind you that we would like to see you back here three o'clock with SOC uh, tomorrow, Tuesday for another forum, bringing you the latest information and resource and actions you can take about the coronavirus um, and civic engagement and our regular programming at SAC. Thank you to our sponsors, Wisconsin Voices, Community Develop Block Grants, Neo Philanthropy State Infrastructure Fund, Movement of Voter Project, Catholic Campaign for Human Development, Zilber Foundation, City of Milwaukee Office of Violence Prevention, Tides Foundation, City of Milwaukee Promise Zone, and all the faithful individuals who support SOC through their personal donations, we thank you. Thank you, and we'll see you back with us tomorrow, three o'clock with SOC. Please, please, please remember to fill out your surveys. You can find the link in our comments section. <laughs>